primarily for their data. And that doesn't change. And that's really important to understand, that you need to understand as security professionals what your responsibilities are when you, uh, when you take a bit of the cloud and use it. I wish it was a flat line. It's not. You can buy, you can get infrastructure service, which is the most basic thing. So uh, the compute, the storage, the hardware, the electricity that's provided is all provided by the cloud provider. But as you buy more containers of service, platforms of service, software as a service, this responsibility changes. And again, you need to understand it. It's in the documentation for each of the services. It's really important that you understand this and understand what you're responsible for in terms of that. Like everything, there's good and bad, you know, there's pros and cons and it's your business use case. So, you know, while you may want full responsibility, as an example, when Log4j came out, we had 14,000 people all circle onto that problem. You know, that's quite a good thing to outsource. But again, it's your business cases. It's what you want a service provider to be doing, what you trust them to do, etc. Those are the things that you need to consider. So, I asked you to vote. <laughs> uh, I'll let you vote once more if, you've, if you want. Um, okay, so, so the QR code there. So, what we've been doing is we have essentially created a, a, the equivalent of the MITRE framework within, within AWS, and we've been categorizing all the instances that we deal with. One of the major things that we look at is the initial access method most often used by threat actors. So you've got cross permissions, vulnerable apps, uh, web apps, uh, brute force, locked or le uh, leaked access keys, credentials, open bucket, and DDoS. Let's see how people voted. Okay, at number one is vulnerable web apps at 42%, lost and leaked keys, 38%, open buckets, cross account. And uh, DDoS was a bit of a trick question. It's not an initial access. So it's an annoyance, but it's not actually how you get inside the cloud. Let's find out what the answers are. So leaked access keys and credentials at a whopping two-thirds, okay? So this is uh, the threat actor not really trying that hard, you know, and, and, and a lot of this, so there's two ways of getting in, really. There is console access and uh, access keys. When it's console access, can you guess how many times I have seen MFA enabled and that has been bypassed? Zero. Okay. Um, access keys, incredibly powerful, but not in the wrong hands. You know, really consider, do you need those access keys? And there's plenty of ways of obfuscating them. Okay. Too often, they're in GitHub. And we tell people they're in GitHub. We might be emailing the wrong person because a threat actor might have changed the contact email. Um, yes. And also, when the threat... Okay. This is a thing that brings a tear to my eye every day, okay? A third of those access credentials are root. 20% of everything we're dealing with is the customer has lost root access. That's very, very bad. <laughs> um, you know, please get off root. You can close your account with root. It's gone forever. Goodbye. There are active, all the activities on root don't need to be done by root. So your first activity is get off root, hide away the key. Don't create keys, hide away your password, MFA enabled. Guess what the threat actor does if they get root? Enable MFA, because they believe in strong security, okay? The others are the, uh, are the public facing, so, so the services, and unsurprising, EC2 is one of the largest at 13%. We are seeing a spike in API gateways. And again, this is just the validation of the input. So the person confirming who they are. You know, or do you have an open API gateway or are you confirming the transaction is correct? What are the uh, threat actor patterns that we're seeing? <coughs> uh, resource hijacking, that's, you know, 
great, get the cloud to do it for you. Ransom events. Now, in terms of ransom events, this isn't your typical encryption, pay the money, decryption. A lot of the time, this is just deletion and, ex and basically extortion. So I've deleted it, I kept this, I'm going to release it, give me the money. We, it's difficult, and we'll talk about the questions about has the data been exfiltrated? It's difficult to tell, but we have some indicators. But most of the time, this is just trying to extort the money. They have no intention of giving you the data back. The other one we've seen a little bit of a rise in is a sort of scorched earth policy. The disgruntled employee, or, and this maybe it's just my anecdotal uh, experience, but developers that people have got may be quite cheap and haven't been paid and, and so on and so you know. So be very careful who you employ, but all of these, you know, could have been, could have been, the blast radius could have been minimized by really considering what permissions everybody has. Usual stuff. We know this. But as identity is the boundary in the cloud, it is really important understanding what permissions you're giving people. And also, I showed you earlier what permissions you're giving a service. And let's get on to the permissions I gave to a service. So my EC2. Um, unfortunately, in my rush, I also put a vulnerable web app on it, or I developed a vulnerable web app on it as well. In addition, this EC2 is running something called Instance Metadata for Service Version 1, which uh, you'll see in a bit. Uh, meta the metadata services is absolutely vital to the EC2 in terms of you uh, troubleshooting, being able to do different things. It tells you about the EC2 information you may need in terms of programmatic access. All of these things... I've talked about in terms of how we're going to um, execute this is cannot be attributed to one misconfiguration failure. And I really like the analogy, the Swiss cheese analogy in, um, in industrial accidents where, you know, each slice of cheese is a security measure, but they all have holes in them. If all of those holes line up, then you have these accidents. And this is exactly saying, you look at some of the high profile security incidents. I mean, the Microsoft one is absolutely classic. I mean, all the things that had to go wrong for that to happen. And again, this is exactly the same. So there were tiny tweaks here that could have, could have prevented this. But, you know, this is a perfect, perfect storm of all of these misconfigurations lining up. So a crafted HTTP request. Uh, you get the, you get, which uses, so you get onto the IMDSV version one, you steal the security token, and STS, security token service, is a sort of workhorse within, within AWS, which is providing roles and permissions as you go along, so making sure that something has permission for a certain time, and so on. And so, now, the bad actor has admin, because we gave the EC2 Admin. We didn't have to give it EC2, but hey, why not give them EC2? Live changeover. How's that? Oh no. Better? Can you hear me at the back? Thank you. Okay. So what does bad actor do? I don't know. Maybe uh, deploy a CloudFormation template, spin up lots of metal instant, uh, EC2 instances and, and crypto mine, and look at all that money. Oops, that's went really quick. Anyway, a lot of money went to the uh, bad actor there. Now, I know what you're thinking. Oh, a bit complicated. How would I possibly write a CloudFormation template? Do not fear. You can go on GitHub. Um, I'm watching you don't. Um, <laughs> you can go on GitHub. There are forums. There are service desks. There's help towards this. Okay? So what I'm trying to say is this threat is real. There's industries behind this just looking for those exposed access keys, you know, credentials being fished and so on. Um, and you read these GitHub, <laughs> you, hear, you read the introductions to these GitHub, it's very, it's very um, not very believable, their reason for writing these. When you consider it's a 57 to 1 ratio in terms of compute power cost to actually return, 
not really much point running this yourself. Okay, shall we see this for real? So here we, and by the way, pay attention because I may or may not have set up a uh, website at the end where you can where you can practice this. Okay, so uh, um, and I'll explain a bit more, but if you want to, oh sorry, let me go back. Okay, so I have my website. It's amazing what you do is oh you upload your image there. You actually upload the URL of that image, and what you get in return is this strange uh, URL. But you see that demo.php question mark. So I wonder if it, you put equal HTTPS, I wonder what you do, what you could do if you could actually craft, craft this slightly different. So this is what I put at the end of that. Does anybody recognize that? A few smiling faces. So that is, that is the metadata server. So if you're inside your, your EC2, that is, that is how you call the metadata service on your EC2. I apologize that you might not be able to see that, but what I'm doing there is curling it. And then what you're seeing is all the list of metadata stuff there. Pretty cool. Well, I think it's cool. Okay, so now what I want to do, sorry, that's the same one, isn't it? Yeah, apologies. There we go. Okay, so I'm inside the metadata service. Then I go to IAM and I look at security credentials. What this does is this tells me the role that is attached, the name of the role that is attached to the EC2. I run that, and it's called web dev. Ooh, that's exciting. What does web dev tell me? So I can now go inside web dev, and here you go. So this is the access key, the security access key, and the token. And this is called SSRF. This is server-side forgery request. So the EC2 believes this request is coming from inside the EC2. It's not. It's coming from the web app outside of that. That's all. So... I now have information there to now assume this role. Hopefully it's admin. All I do is export those. I also had to find the region, if in doubt, US East 1, but uh, it was, you can see that within this. And I'm not foolish. So this first of all confirms you get caller identity. So it's basically saying, you know, who am I? Um, and you'll see there, the ARN there, you can see it says web dev and then I dash zero. So if you know, if you know AWS, you'll know that's an instance, um, an instance ID, which is kind of weird. You know, it, you can see console login from that. You're going, how is an EC2, which has no thumbs, able to log into console? So I've tried then to create an user. This one didn't have admin. I can't. I'm not allowed to do that. Um, but it's demonstration there. If you look up AWS cert workshops, there's a whole workshop on this where you can run this yourself and, and, and practice it. Okay? So it's just a demonstration of all of those things that line up that facilitated this. Oops. Apologies. And at all of these stages, you know, so, you know, crafted HTTP request that could have been prevented by having, you know, a, a vulnerability scanner against your web app. Uh, using IMDS v1, they're defaulting to two now. Um, you will get lots of warnings telling you that your old, your EC2s are using IMDS v1 and you may want to upgrade them to two. Um, security token returned a very privileged security token, and then, you know, obviously the, the deployment of the CloudFormation template. The Swiss cheese model. All these things that could have gone wrong. And what I'm trying to, I'm not trying to show you how to hack here. I'm trying to show you, um, and I had to, this had to go through PR, so I definitely not. Um, that for you to understand this better and understand these, how these exploitations work, you can better approach those problems within your cloud environment. And, you know, I'll reiterate, this isn't unique to AWS. Yeah. 
it really is at the moment from what we're seeing eat your vegetable security like basic stuff if you um, if you do the basics right you won't be speaking to our team because you know you're thinking about that the low hanging fruit is being picked off at the moment don't get me wrong we're seeing more and more sophisticated threat actors but um, you know just please put yourself in that security posture um, as high as you can so, inaccurate AWS account information. Once you spin up loads of EC2s and so on, and once your keys are on GitHub, etc., we send you emails to tell you this, and we will put you into fraud status and so on. So, it's really useful if we're emailing, you know, your team and not just one person who's left the company and so on. You know, basic stuff like that. Unintended disclosure of keys is, is paramount. Have you really looked at all of your users? I can tell you great cases. I can't because I'm not allowed to talk about them. Where somebody has had keys stolen and they were able to do nothing. You know, because, and, and give those security people a pay rise, they looked at it and they restricted the permissions of that user. And again, doesn't users aren't just humans. They are things without thumbs. Um, you know, you could have your your guard duty, whatever whatever um, detect detecting service you have, flashing red lights. But if it's sat in the corner there, you know, what are you doing about it? You can role play these. You can practice these. It's a moving landscape. Okay, we are seeing latest technologies come out, and and the threat actors looking how to exploit them. So unfortunately, <laughs> it's a continuous learning game, and you know. You need to think about, you know, I rushed my dragon cat, believe it or not, okay? You really need to think, take that step back and be that voice. You know all this, you know, but those developers are being, you know, the developers are being pushed hard to deliver, be that voice of reason saying that's great. However, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Okay. I know why you're here. You want to hear the stories. You don't want to hear all that. Okay, I'll see what I can do. Let's first of all talk about how do we approach a security investigation so that if you need to or you're going to um, do that. So let's take the example of uh, crypto mining. And with your account, you get 90 days of free event management logs. They are in each region, okay? And be very careful, global, global services are in US East 1 and the rest may be in the services. So you need to go down to each of those regions and look at those cloud trail logs, okay? But you'd be looking for run instances. What that will then tell you is possibly the access key, the username, and the IP address. So what you're looking for straight away is what is the indicator of compromise? We do have people saying, can you show if we've been hacked? You know, we had... We had we were looking through 80 million logs a few weeks ago. Can't do it unless you know. How do we know one cloud trail um, call is correct and one isn't? We need user context. And again, for yourselves, you understand your environment. What is the user context? Did somebody mean to run that instance, or is that absolutely you didn't mean to run that instance? Great. We know that's in, we know that's an indicator of compromise. Then we can work backwards from there and and continue. So we've got this run instance. We can we can uh, relate it to the access keys, the usernames, the IP addresses, and we can see if that user, with the user, was created or the access key was created. And if that user was created, well, that probably means the user that created it is actually the threat actor. And we have this: we have multiple chains of access keys being created, and so on. And you're working them all back to that single point of entry and hopefully it's within the last 90 days unless you've enabled your own logs. So again, as a company, is 90 days sufficient or do you want to have your own logs and do you want to put them all into one location? And we will circle around this until we find that point of entry. And then what we have is the initial access, which tells us uh, which access key, which user it is and, and so on. We can rotate those and uh, then we get a lot, a lot of times we're asked, how was that access key stolen? Don't know. It's like asking the police, my house was burgled. I used a key. Where did I drop my key? You know, it's an impossible question. All we can tell you is when it was first used within the AWS 
environment. Got to check all regions. Um, you know, what the first thing I'll ask, do you have any logs enabled? And you hear me slightly cry when I hear no. Please do enable logs. Is it important for you to enable logs? You know, and again, retention and protection appropriately. One of the other questions we always get asked, and it's particularly relevant in the EMEA region, is was my data stolen? Now, as I said, you get 90 days of event logs. They only tell you at a bucket, bucket level what's gone on, created bucket, delete bucket. If you want to know if objects have been uh, put or get, and normally it's get, then you need to have enabled uh, S3 CloudTrail logs. And, <coughs> excuse me, and, you know, if you're holding PII, those are the sort of questions you need. What's your data? What's your critical data? And is it uh, held there? One other thing I'd like to emphasize here. How many of you think if your S3 bucket is deleted, AWS can recover it? We can't. Okay, when it's gone, it's gone. And a lot of people think, okay, I moved my critical data into the cloud. That's great. We do... We have a resilience plan. We have it replicated in six different regions, but that's the latest copy. So if, it's, if there's nothing in there, we've got six copies of it, nothing in there. Okay. You, again, you need to look, is your data in the cloud, the single data, and have you chosen a backup policy? You know, what are the protections against that? There is a lot of assumption that, you know, and, and there's very good legal reasons why that's the case in terms of, you know, you control that data. It may be a legal requirement that you have to get that rid of that data at that time. So uh, that's sometimes not understood. Okay, so here's an example of... Uh, uh, it's a while back now. So uh, the overly successful shutout, I called it. So an exposed access key. And it had limited permissions, but they were able to see which users were admin and they were also able to reset their passwords. Fortunately, two of the users had MFA enabled. Unfortunately, the third user didn't have MFA enabled. So they're able to reset the password, set the password, and they then uh, privilege escalated themselves to user number three and were admin and started resource hijacking. They then did something which could have been quite good, but it wasn't great. They applied, which is an AWS managed policy, deny all. But they applied it to everything, including themselves. So not only did it stop <laughs> crypto mining and notify the customer because they couldn't log in that somebody was in there, they locked themselves out. Good news story here, of course, they had root. They could recover all of this. And it was a fantastic lesson to identify and, and you know. I'm calling this a multi-cloud storm, and a lot of companies now, and, and, and rightfully so, are going for the multi-cloud solution, um, which is great, but obviously the crown jewels are now the identity provider, and that becomes a real challenge for us. So we can only see in AWS. So that means somebody could be coming in at all sorts of angles within, within, our, within the AWS, and there's no way of determining if they're valid or they're not. Unless we see some obvious things like create users, delete, you know, run instances and so on. But even if we find that, they may have federated into another user. So it becomes really complicated and really what you need to do is be working with the identity provider to provide those logs. Then you'll be able to see where they're coming in to uh, the various cloud providers. So this... This was a multi-cloud example where a user had federated in and they were trying to apply this policy. Now, it's actually quite, you know, to me it's quite, quite a detailed policy. It's basically allowing you to delete trails, stop cloud trail, um, and also mess around with config. Config is a really powerful um, tool which allows you to configure and set configurations. They tried about 20 times to apply, apply this policy and it just kept denying. And... What then happened is they, they went back out and then they federated as another user. Now, this was a gang or, you know, st state level because 
we were, you know, there are multiple IP addresses, or like they're time traveling or so, you know. Um, but what they then came in, they federated the user with those permissions and, and managed to apply these policies. And, and our sort of, uh, sort of conclusion is this was a, a, you know, a junior or somebody learning their trade, but a really noisy activity. And obviously the supervisor came on and went, come on, you must know that you don't have permissions to do this. Because I don't think somebody who'd be able to write that policy would, would not realize the basic mistake that they didn't have the permissions to apply that policy. So it was quite, um, yeah, I enjoyed it. <laughs> um, okay, so the key takeaway to this, you know, we are making this far too easy for the threat actors. And, you know, really basic stuff. You know, basic security will protect you. So, and it's complicated. I absolutely get that. But the more you understand, the more you get into the, you know, the, the understanding of the cloud providers, the different security measures and why they're there and why they're important, the better, you know. Threat modeling is absolutely, you know, the way to go with these things. The tabletop exercises, the amount of times it's, it's a process thing in terms of actually it's not a technological thing. It is, you know, what happens to this? Who do I need to inform? Who's the expert of this actually understands this? You know, what if my S3 bucket is deleted uh, or, you know, people have left a ransom note saying I've got all your data. How would we know that? Do we have the logs enabled? Those sort of things. And really, you know, never stop learning. It's, it's a constant, you know, every day I'm learning and I'm sure it's exactly the same with yourselves. So, a bit of a challenge for you. You've seen how it's done. That will be up till five o'clock. I actually had the security team page me and say, you know, you left an easy two. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I can't, I can't hold it open any longer than five o'clock. Okay. So the challenge is put uh, inside the B-Sides Belfast S3 bucket, uh, put a text document uh, with your details, like uh, LinkedIn or whatever, and we'll do a little photo shoot after World well Avenue. I did have some stickers, but I left them in Dublin. Sorry about that. I'll post them to you. Um, cool. A couple of things. Firstly, a shameless plug. Um, we run a couple of Twitch shows um, every Thursday. I do one at 11 a.m. I'm the one without the bucket on my head. Um, and, you know, there's the, 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 the North American crew one to one on, on uh, Friday at 7 p.m. So AWS slash dot uh, TV slash Twitch. I'm doing the very, you know, basic, you know, security startup. The Friday one is, is higher level. So, you know, do please come along. It's very interactive. Um, and the more the better. The final thing I'd like to say is this. I went to my first B-Sides in 2011. Um, I always walk away from these things being absolutely humbled, reminded how much I don't know. So if you feel like that, don't worry about it. It's absolutely a normal thing. And, you know, secondly, this is, you know, a volunteer event run by amazing people. And, you know, please do thank them. They're taking time out of their day, you know, and a lot of time out of their day and, and, and to do this. So, you know, if you have a chance, Please thank the people because these we only get we only get better as a community stronger together. Okay, thank you very much.